the virtual red bench. I am Abby, if you don't already know me. I'm the director at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, the Red Bench Speaker Series is now in its sixth season. Uh, this season kicked off last month with an in-person event with Hillary Girardi. If you missed that discussion, you can find a recording on our YouTube channel. Tonight's event is our first virtual event of the season. And I want to remind everyone that the museum is a nonprofit organization, and we truly rely on the generosity of our members, our donors, sponsors, and event attendees. So while this event is complimentary, we do suggest a $10 donation from each person because it absolutely makes a difference. It not only helps us keep this series going, but it helps keep, keep us in operation. So if you have the capacity to make a donation, we hope that you will. As a small token of our appreciation, each donation in increments of $10 will be entered into a raffle for a pair of darn tough socks, as we have for the past three years. Uh, $10 gets you one entry, $30 gets you three, and so on. I'll draw two winners tomorrow, giving you plenty of time to make those donations tonight. And as long as I remember, I will put the link in the chat as soon as I'm done here. Um, and speaking of making the series possible, we owe a great deal of gratitude to our Red Bench series sponsors. I want to thank our silver sponsor, Scholler Textile, our bronze sponsors, AJ Ski and Sports, RK Miles, Sisler Builders, and our media sponsor, Vermont Ski and Ride. So tonight we're joined by award-winning photographer Gary Land. Gary is the mastermind and creator of East Street Archives, a 437-page book dedicated to the riders of snowboarding's golden era. Gary became immersed in the Vermont snowboard scene in the 90s, and the trajectory of his career had him photographing the likes of Allen Iverson, Venus Williams, Tom Brady, and hundreds more. We'll learn how he came back to snowboarding and how his new book, E Street Archives, came to be. This book is truly remarkable, and once you have it in your hands and feel the weight of it, you'll understand how incredible it really is. And we do have copies available in our online shop if you would like to place an order. Moderating tonight's event is Gary's longtime friend, Chris Copley. Chris is a Burton veteran who traveled the world as the pro team manager, and for 12 years, he was the announcer at the U.S. Open in Stratton. We will answer audience questions at the end, so please type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Not the chat, but the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of those as we can after the discussion. And I'm now going to hand this over to you, Chris, to officially introduce Gary and get this discussion started. Thanks a lot, Abby. Um, this is something that really uh, is going to mean a lot to a lot of different people. And it's kind of funny. Uh, this, I think there's three different people who are going to be tuning in to this series. I mean, one of them is the people who are actually kind of in the 90s and, and were, were part of this, this scene that was happening. And it, it pretty much was more than just all over New England. There, there was even a bigger concentric circle than that. So some of those folks are going to tune in. So we want to say, you know, welcome and very happy that, that those folks are here. And then with Gary, he has such a huge other part of his career that there are people who are going to tune in tonight that pretty much don't know a lot about his snowboarding career. They know him from all the pro athletes and the entertainers and things. And it's just a very interesting arc how snowboarding you know it it's it was like the foundational part of what gary took a hold of and said hey this is going to be my career so there's those folks right and then there's also the folks for, who are just fans of the red bench series i mean i've listened to quite a few of the presentations and um you know there's people who are just like hey i'm, I'm interested in anything that red bench puts out there because you know the content is interesting right so um Let's let's kind of let me let me get into this. I just want to give a little bit of, of an intro that the way I see it is that you know the whole sport of snowboarding is really it's it's connective, right? So one person teaches another person how to snowboard. You know, no one's born knowing how to do this. And so somebody else might invite somebody, hey, come along with me and like let's 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 try snowboarding, right? And when you think of the millions of people that have snowboard out there, like it really all started with just one person saying, Hey. This is so fun. Like, come into this community, join me, or try this out, learn this. And that's something that I think is really special about snowboarding. And, um, you know, I look, I just got to say it, you know, Jake Burton passed away, you know, somewhat recently. And, you know, he's kind of the one that was a foundational person. So rest in peace to Jake Burton. But this whole connectedness that we're talking about, 
I think Gary has started something um, with East, you know, the, this East Street Archives. And it's like, well, well, what is this? You know, for some folks who don't know, well, it's more than just a website. You can go to the East Street Archives website, check it out. There's an Instagram page that has really, really great content there. The book is really special. And that's kind of what we, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to really check this out. I mean, such a labor of love to put this thing together. But there'll also be an event coming up in March, which is, we'll give you more information on that towards the end. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff. There's merchandise, there's like, you know, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, stickers. Like, if, if you want to be a part of the East Street Archives community, it, it's all there for you. And it's, you know, tonight we want to kind of express our gratitude for people that are already like really, really diving in deep onto this because it, it's a lot of fun. One thing I want to talk about too is this uh, this one guy, Pat Bridges, who was really foundational. Gary met him real early on when he when he moved to Killington and moved to Vermont. He's a huge kingpin in the in snowboarding over the years, and he uh, ran Snowboarder Magazine. He has his own magazine now. Just an incredible historian. But he has an intro that he wrote as part of the book. And one of the, the quips that he said that I love, he said, you know, that each one of these photos that you look at in the book, they have a resonance to them. And I love that word resonance because they do resonate. Like when, when people see them, they're not just the most beautiful, oh, perfect blue sky shot and the guy and the rider is looking perfect. It's like, no, there's way more story too how the photo was captured, who that rider was, when it was happening, there's a resonance to them. And, you know, as Gary's career changed in snowboarding, you know, the, the equipment changed. He got even better as a photographer. And now he's, you know, world-class shooting like ad campaigns, making, you know, incredible amounts of money. So very, very inspiring to see that. Um, not to go to get too windy here, but, uh, you know, this all happened in the the pre-commodification of snowboarding like before the olympics this is before mega media before the x games but what was really special about new england okay is and and where gary was the epicenter of it was we had local media okay so before kids had cell phones before kids had computers there was local media regional media, I should say, like Neil Korn had this magazine called Eastern Edge, which is really important. And, and Gary actually did some work with them. Then there was this other one called East Infection, really, like those dudes were agitators and awesome. And a lot of those guys are still in the mix in snowboarding. And, you know, you, you also had, you know, Mark Sullivan, who is somebody who is still really doing great work. And uh, he has this thing called the Snowboard Journal. So anyway, that media, Gary, Gary's images and his efforts fed into that media. And, uh, and that was really important for these writers to get exposure. So anyway, the thing is, this book is not a history of snowboarding. It's not a history of the 90s. It is a capsule of an incredible scene but what's important to note is that this scene was happening in all, all over the country and really all over the world where kids would say, I'm moving to the mountains. I'm, do, I'm doing this. This is what my life mission is right now. I want to get really good at snowboarding because it's so damn fun. So Colorado, California, the Northwest, Michigan, like these kids were in it, like living it. But what's different here in the East Coast was Gary is one of the people who was capturing this whole thing. And we're all really fortunate, you know, that he did that. And aside from capturing it, is what this book is all about is the dedication to showcase it all. So Gary, that's a long intro, but I do want to just thank you tremendously for documenting this and uh, let's dive into this here. So, um, you know, I just want to talk to you initially, you know, about, like, how did you discover snowboarding to start off with and then leading into how did you end up saying, hey, man, I'm going to Vermont? Like, so give me some background there. Wow. Well, one, thanks for that intro. That was, that was amazing. And hey, I'm like, this is, yes, bringing me back, man. Of course, all that <laughs> stuff resonates so much with me. Yeah, I mean, snowboarding, um, you know, I grew up in Virginia Beach, skating, surfing. Um, those were the things that meant a lot to me. I worked at a surf shop and... Um, I remember just, you know, getting 
a couple of snowboards that came in. This guy, Jerry Lowe, was a rep and had we had some vision boards that came in and along with those boards came some videos. And I just remember seeing it, it was so foreign to me at the time. And, you know, seeing those things uh, get in the shop and I'm like, what, you know, and what the hell is this? It just didn't make sense to me. And then seeing the videos and watching these guys like do their things on snow was like, oh my God, I have to try this. So that was kind of the first time I ever really saw snowboarding. And it was definitely like super early nineties, like 91. And um, I just, you know, even though I had a busy schedule, and a lot of things going on, I was surfing and skating all the time. I just, it always was in the back of my head. I got to try this. I got to try this. And I remember going one time, you know, one time to the mountain of Killington, me and my buddy, and it was like on the gondola, the old gondola, the old orange gondola going up, you know, literally, and this was back in the day when I never snowboarded in my life, you know, had a stolen board out of the back of, you know, bought a board out of the back of someone's car in Virginia Beach and took it to the mountains, went all the way up to the top to the peak at Killington and tried to ride down and pretty much killed myself the entire way down the mountain. But you know what? It was at the end and getting back on the gondola all bruised and battered and could barely sit down. I'm like, you know what? This is amazing. Like, I, it's so, it was just such a good, amazing time. So that is what started it all for me. And, you know. And then you went back to Virginia Beach and then said, I'm doing this. I'm moving to Vermont. So let, tell us about that. Well, it's funny. I went, killing yeah. I'm going there. Going back, you know, there's a long ride from Virginia, in a Mazda RX-7 front wheel drive vehicle going from, from Virginia Beach to Vermont. It was quite, uh, quite the trip. So, you know, going there, being super psyched to try something the first time and then going back all like super t exhausted and like super stoked, just thinking of the possibilities of just like, oh my God, can you imagine just like dropping everything that we know and moving there? And I was like, no, I can't because I have a, you know, my dad, I've got, you know, got a job, I've got a girlfriend. And, you know, the more I thought about it and the more I dreamt about snowboarding day in and day out, I'm like, I can't wait to do this next trip. And we took a next trip within, I would have to say a month. And that is when the ride up, like an exhausting, whatever it was, 10 to 12, I forget what, how many hours it was. We're like, dude, let's just, just come on. My buddy's like so convincing. Let's just go and just see if they're hiring. I'm not saying we're going to move there, but let's just see if they're hiring. I'm like, skip, dude, come on. I'm not moving to Vermont. We go. I wanted to humor him going, they're not going to hire us on the spot. Lo and behold, we go to the Killington Base Lodge. Yeah, man, when can you start? We're like, well, what, I haven't even, what do you want to do? You can do whatever you want. You want to be a sales guy? You want to run the lift? They were just desperate for people. Yeah. So, and then he was like, okay, we got jobs. Let's go see if we can find a place to live. I'm not kidding you. That's how it went down. I don't even think our second trip we rode. It was just yeah. like, we're now moving to Vermont, which was news yeah. to me at the time. So he was really instrumental in me making the move. And um, great. Well, when, when you got there I, and then you did start riding, I mean, what, the vibe, like, did you see like the, some of the crew of riders? Like there was, there was a scene going on there. Like there were, there was a, there were these groups of kids and that, you know, I mean, Hey, I, I don't know the year, but Killington didn't even allow snowboarding until no. like really late. And so it was amazing to me that there was this young group of riders that like just took it, like took it so seriously and up the ante and they were pushing each other. And like, did you connect with the, with all those dudes like right away? I did not connect. I didn't see anybody snowboarding when we went on the trip. But when I moved there within that same year, I moved there in 92. And when I moved there, right away, I saw this. It was like six dudes like that were on the mountain. They were just, I mean, if you saw me, a glimpse of them, they went by. Like, oh, my God, I got to meet those guys. Like, they're doing what I'm doing. I got to, I want to befriend these guys. So they, you know, here I am, this young kid, skate photographer from Virginia Beach. Like, I'm going to, like, try to take photos of these guys. And I remember... It was Ian Spiro, Jim Kelly, Ryan Maracek, Jan Atoski, Chris Berg, Jason Ware. Those yeah. guys were like insanely good at the time. And, I, and you got to remember, the only thing I ever saw was the videos that I was watching. And to me, I thought these guys were just as good as the dudes I'm seeing in these videos. Oh, yeah. The progression, so, yeah. The progression that like that crew specifically, I mean, there was there were other scenes that Stratton and Okemo oh, yeah. and, and you know up at Stowe and even like Sugarloaf and over in Waterville Valley Loon like all of those scenes were, were blowing up but the but the Killington one was kind of interesting because there was there was this small group that really were were very very influential and then mm -hmm. you know something like where 
you know, Killington actually finally took it seriously and hired, you know, Brett Smith to be, you know, this, like just, all right, we got to get real on the snowboard thing. So like really hats off to Brett for kind of getting in that marketing department and talking to the mountain saying, look, at this is what we got to do, you know? And so you okay. were, you know, you, you capturing images, the riders being there, you know, with Brett. So like, let's talk about like, you, here you are, you like with, basic camera equipment shooting photos like what what how did that go down like what what, do you, what, what did you what was your plan to do with those photos you know what, well, you were like, what first let's talk about the plan of like learning how to snowboard and learning how to take photos <laughs> on the snow at the same time like that was really fun yeah um but it was um it was crazy to me i would i was already accustomed to shooting photos of surfing and skating so to me the 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 idea of strapping onto this board and trying to go down this, the, I mean, honestly, the steepest terrain that I had ever seen in my life, because I was used to Massanutten and, you know, Wintergreen in Virginia on skis. So anyway, that was foreign to me. But um, it was, I would have to say, like, I was just liking to get back the photos and look at them and share them. You know, people would come over to the house and we'd be holding up the slides and like, dude, look at how sick you look on this shot. You know, like, it wasn't like I was projecting them or anything. It yeah. was just look at how cool this looks in this little translucent, like, you know, teeny little slide. And, um, but there was something magical about going out there, seeing these guys do these tricks, you know, 180s were the thing or, free, you know, half cabs or 360s. If you were pulling off 360s of the grabs, you were like the king, you know what I mean? Or like just yeah. these, so trying to get these images um, and then getting them back and sharing them with the guys, that was, that was what it was all about. So this leads to something that again, like, all these young shreds they don't know anything about this but like how diff like talk about how stone age the cameras were that you were shooting <laughs> with initially yeah. so, like you there was no i mean and you, you can just go through the whole progression and what's interesting <laughs> is the single shots you know and how difficult it was to capture that shot and then it was on film you had to get it developed you didn't even know if you got if you captured it and then like when sequential photos came in now you have to shoot you know, a lot of photos with this small amount of film and you better, you better be capturing it. So anyway, talk yeah. about that, like the cameras and then the progression of the equipment. Cause that's, that's really interesting. I think. It is, it is, it's very interesting and it can keeps progressing. Obviously I'm still in the, in the, in the business. And I mean, it seems like every month something new comes out, but back then when I first started at a camera, it was probably a Nikon FM two with no motor drive and a 50 millimeter lens. And here I am, you know, taking one shot, click, winding it, waiting for the next shot, click, focusing, manual focusing, hoping that you got the shot. No automatic meters, you know, you had to trust your settings. And then as time went on, better cameras came out. This is a camera that um, I used back in the day. It was a Canon F1 and it's a, just a gorgeous beastie camera. And this actually has a motor drive that shot probably six to eight frames a second. But here you go. I love talking about this because it's so cool. And again, I have kids, guys that work for me young and they don't shoot film at all. So you take a roll of, this is one of my favorite films, Kodachrome 200, which was the, which is the ISO, 36 exposures. It either came in 24 or 36, okay? 36 pictures. Now, trying to shoot a sequence of a trick and if you'd already taken shots pr previous to the start <laughs> of the roll, you had no idea. So- yeah. 36 exposures, changing this day in and day out in the snow, taking off your gloves, getting your fingers cold, film the camera wet. That was what we dealt with all the time. And, you know, six to $10 a roll just to get the roll of film. And you had to get it processed, which is another like $10. And then you're just stuck with the slide, which is like your $20 in per 36 pictures. So now here we go fast forward 25 years and you got this little SD card. 125 gigabyte card. This this right here can hold five to six thousand high res pictures. Come on, dude. What, right. I look at I look at it that way, Chris. If I had the digital camera back in the day, because when I shot snowboarding, it was all film. If I had digital, I can't even imagine what my archives would be like. But I will say this: shooting film and learning how to the analog aspects of photography really, really, really helped me and paved the way. And um, I'll, I'm forever grateful for that. That's great. I mean, the, just to jump ahead a little bit, uh, you told a quick story that just blew my mind when you went out to Mount Hood one time and you were just completely clueless in the summer.
but but tell that story because that's oh, incredible. God. like we almost ended your career <laughs> now, now i'm not even talking the riding oh, long story those stories this is like what happened to your your vision oh the, the vision part of it dude that's i mean I, there was a lot of lessons i learned at mount hood i feel like every year i got smacked in the face with some sort of lesson um you know the first year i went there was with the guys i grew up with at killington they were all we're all my homies going out there going oh my god we're we are we were so excited i can't like it would be the equivalent of going to like a super bowl with all your friends it was like that was like the place to be in the summer we're gonna get a tan we're gonna rock out we're gonna skate we're gonna you know snowboard i go there okay didn't know what to expect no sunglasses no sunscreen shooting all day I get back and we're staying at the Shamrock Hotels, me, Pat Bridges, like Jason, Jimmy, Ryan, all of us, right? Dick Ness over. I, I'm like, why do my eyes hurt so bad? I'm like, and then I look in the mirror and they're bubbling. They're bubbled up and there's like sandpaper. I'm getting freaked oh, out. Pat, Pat's like, dude, <laughs> Pat smoking a butt. You gotta go, to, you gotta go to the hospital, man. Oh my God. So we go to the hospital. They got me like in gauze and like, shit i had to put in my eyes i'm laying up in the shamrock hotel for two days like without taking it off because they said i had ret retinal burn mm -hmm. from the glacier so that was one lesson um and well i'm still paying the price of that now because i've got pterygium because of that you know which is fine it's minor but then we almost lost our lives one night one day because we didn't know the mountain and what it was capable of and we hiked from hood meadows over to hood to try to you know uh gap this little cornice this little um, crack in this cornice and then when we got there it took us about six hours longer than we thought to get there and once we got there the sun was going down and we we're stuck on the wall of this cornice that looked like it was going to give at any moment and the story is long you can read the whole story in the book but yeah. we were we were we did not die we uh we honestly was probably the closest to death i've ever been and I say that because when I'm, I'm riding across, imagine a loaf of bread stacked up and you got the brown crust. Well, imagine if you took each piece of bread and you separated it by like four inches. So all this, all of them are stacked up. Well, I had to like strap in and ride across the top of a loaf of bread, looking down thousands of feet below me with nothing, but just like I had to look straight. And I just remember looking down once and seeing it go from bright blue to black all the way down. And I'm like, yeah. you know, and then I, I think a couple of days later, that thing collapsed and killed two hikers. So I'm thankful, man. I'm thankful. It was a lesson learned, and I would never do that again. <laughs> well, it's funny, like, you know, East Coast kids, they're, they're riding, like, gnarly terrain, hard snow and all this. But, you know, you can go to a completely different area, like avalanches or, you know, things like that, where you can, you can completely get lost, you know. So snowboarding is, like, it, it's such a rad sport. But, like, I, a lot of times, like, when you're a young kid, you, you just don't, you're not evaluating the consequences or you're not, you're just so stoked to be doing it that sometimes, you know, that stuff gets, gets put out of your mind. But anyway, this, I, the book has some great stories. I mean, some crash stories, you know, with, with uh, Kevin Scott and stuff like that. So then people, when they dig in, in the book, there's so many really excellent stories. Um, there maybe we should uh maybe abby should throw in some of i've got like eight images up that kind of show some of the <laughs> snowboarding images from back then they're kind of all over the place but maybe we'll show those a little bit and just kind of get yeah. that going you know i i loved one of the quotes like you, you know you you ran around and interviewed a lot of your you know the real special people that were uh you know that you worked with over time you know the right and and that those interviews that are on you know you know i mean people would just salivate and couldn't wait to listen to you interview some of these guys and hear hear their stories from back in the day but like in the book you like you had different people kind of write a little blurb about their time and how special this was and i love one of the Je jesse huffman quotes he says you know, snowboarding equaled freedom, it was rebellion, and it was self-expression, you know, and that's something that is really true about snowboarding is the competitiveness was one thing, but there was people who had their own personal style of riding, and the and the, the kids that you, you rode with, like, this dude Ryan Maracek was gnarly, like, burly, he just rode completely different than most people, like, would break so many boards, and I mean, Burton had to actually, they used him as a tester because he could break a board 
in every single day that he rode. Yeah, what was his, what was his, tell, tell everybody his nickname. Remember his oh, nickname? Crusher, that was it. You know, he would, I'd <laughs> shoot you up at my office and I'd be like, dude, come on, you broke three more boards. We just gave you those, you know, yeah. but that's, that's how powerful he was. But then you'd have someone like Jimmy Kelly or Jason Ware that would just fluid and stylish and like they they just made it look so easy you know and it's that self-expression is something that was was really special like i mean that image of of noah brandon right there this is something i wanted to talk to you about yeah how much of it of this is a setup where you have to talk to the rider the rider's telling you what they're going to do and you you're like oh this guy's regular foot or he's goofy foot so i got to be here to capture the sun's here yeah. or is it more like dude i'm hitting this like, and then you're just capturing it. Like, what, where are you at with your connection, talking to the writer about what they're going to do versus they're just going to do it and you're going to, you're going to shoot it? I think it was a mixture of both because I think being an East Coast snowboarding photographer, my job was to always try to make things that weren't maybe so grand look as cool as they could look. So that was like, you know, having the right lens, getting low, making things look big, you know, um, those types of things. And then, you know, we're going down the mountain, I'm following a posse, we're like trying to like session a specific hit or a rail or, or a tree or a gap or something. And obviously, I wanted to get down before them, I wanted to set up, I had to uh, gauge who was goofy, who was regular, am I going to get a, you know, an ass shot, yeah. am I going to get a, what was the grab, was somebody going to do a trick, that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't say, okay, uh, rider A, what are you doing? Okay, B, you know, it was more like, I'm going to get down, I'm going to get comfortable, whatever you do, I'm going to shoot it. Now, obviously, this shot of of of, of uh, Mark Riley and Dick Nessover, this was a completely a setup shot because I was trying to shoot this cover of uh, Eastern Edge magazine, and we were playing with how that was going to look. And but that was fun, right? It was all fun, whether oh, it was yeah. a setup shot, whether it was like you know just freedom of just riding and shooting whatever. I always found you know each thing that we did, I always was satisfied. Oh, stop. This, <laughs> this is it. This is it right here. Andrew Muddy, like this, when this was on the cover of Snowboarder, it was just like, what is going on here? Like, mm. like this was just, like, this was like you you're looking at a UFO. Like people were just like, this is, how did he get up there? Or is he going down there? Like it was so groundbreaking and radical. And, uh, I mean, you know, Muddy is kind of like an anti-hero, you know, and you had people in snowboarding like Hobie Chittenden or, or you know, uh, Jerry Tucker, but like Muddy was like coming to this scene. He was like, he brought people along. Like you wanted to be in his wake of destruction because that dude yeah. was a baller, you know. Muddy was Pissa. Oh, Pissa is right. Muddy was Pissa. Muddy was, now this funny, this photo was taken, I, I completely left snowboarding, I had my beautiful family in, in Boston, um, you know, I'm already at this point working at Reebok, and Muddy calls me up, he's like, Gah, what are you doing, Gah? I'm like, what? I'm working, Muddy. He's like, dude, you gotta, right now, you gotta leave, you gotta leave work, you gotta come, you gotta meet me, this is the, dude, I'm telling you, it's gonna be the cover, and I'm like, and he was like, I'd never seen him like that, so I'm like, all right, Muddy, I, you know, asked my boss, hey, I'm gonna, I gotta take a long lunch break go into the city and I, I love the scene. I'm like, I remember like, what is he doing? So I pull in and we had gotten a crazy dump, pull around the corner by Beth Israel Hospital. I see his uh, Ford, the fresh court with the rainbow rail on it. And I'm like, okay, he's not in a car. And I kind of get out, I got my bag and I hear this, like, yeah! I look up I'm like, where the hell? And there he is strapped into the top of this like five story parking garage. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, this is going to be piss out, whatever. And I'm like, muddy. That shot is. Anyway, I shot. Out. He did it like three times. Yeah, and so um, good. I just remember but, as we're shooting, I'm shooting that going, oh, my God. This is one of the craziest things I've ever seen. So well, be before we get to your move to Boston, because I definitely want to get to that here. And yeah, of course. Second, but, you know, at the end of the season, there were these huge, you know, really important events. So you had like spring loaded world quarters and obviously the U S open. Right. So like you were, you, you, you know, you had your credentials and stuff to shoot, but there was so much going on in terms of like who you connect with, like, you know, in that photo pit of like shooting big air, shooting, you know, pipe and stuff like that. Like talk about the energy of, of, you know, pro probably more with the U.S. Open, but then also those other events yeah. where they were a lot looser, but still a lot of fun, too. 
I mean, I loved, I lived for the events, right? We all did. We all, because we shot with each other so much, but like, I would say once a year, we would be able to be neck and neck or like shake hands with our freaking heroes. You know, we'd have the best riders in the world coming to Stratton to put on a demo. And like, yeah. you had to be there. And if you weren't, you were either at a funeral or a wedding or something, <laughs> right? So um, at that time, you know, I, I always went to the open. I always shot the open. I think I'd, I had you know, I'd gotten there enough to where I could get, you know, Barry Dugan or someone over in Burton would hit me up with a pass. Yeah. You know, I would have access to the, to the deck, you know, and that's how it started where I could just be on the deck anywhere I wanted. And I'm, you know, shooting with a fish island because I can almost touch the rider. Right. And then over the years, you know, they had pits and ESPN got involved, more sponsors, more money. It became more, you know, of a produced event, which was good. It was good in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. It was bad in a lot of ways. But I found a way to capture what I could capture as the years progressed. And it got to a point for me where like you, you were a number in a corral and you had to like shoot amongst all these international shooters yeah. and you had to find ways. And I remember feeling frustrated um, at one particular open, I think it was 96. That was the one that Brushy Crail shot. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how I was thinking at the time as I'm walking down the back of the pipe going, this is, you know, I'm not getting any shots. And then I remember like seeing, uh, Freaking what's his face um, from Arnett, um, Bruce Harper. So it's Siski. I'm one of the guys. I forget. Oh God, dude, I can't. Believe it. So anyway, I'm, lo I'm lost on names. But anyway, he had the um, Arnett uh, bus there at the bottom, yeah. throwing out frisbees, and I was like, "Yo, can I get on top of this thing and just see the?" He was like, "Yeah, sure." I go up there and I'm looking. And I see this view that I've never seen before right over the mushroom hut. And I'm like, oh, oh dude, it's on. But then I didn't have a lens. I had like a crappy lens. So I see the Japanese photographer and he's just like changing stuff. He's got a giant lens on his back. And I'm like, he's looking at me and he's like, and I'm like, hey, man, uh, can I try your lens? What? Lens? Can I use? Can I just? Yeah, yeah. And it gives me the lens. I'm like, oh, my wow. God. 400 millimeter lens i just put it on my camera and i'm just remember like oh my god i just sat there waiting like terry is it i'm like just picking my shots off like a sniper and that it was just so like and i'll never forget though like that was a moment where i'm like wow if i really it was seeing something for the first time that i had, had never really seen i was mostly like yeah. up in people's grills but now right. taking a step back seeing the entire scene yeah that's that was, such a such an iconic shot yeah that was a pretty cool moment well, you know, the the events, you know, like like spring loaded and, and, and world quarters and stuff, like those were those were like like the the rawness of snowboarding. Yeah. Like the and, and the US Open had some of that. Like, you know, there was like crazy parties and there were insane bands like you know, L7, then they had some different hip hop bands. But like in the book, one of the funniest things you have in the book, I don't know how the heck <laughs> you got it, but this letter from Bob Freeze, who was the president of Stratton. You actually have the printed letter that was an apology yeah. for the rowdiness that was happening on the mountain. And it was sent to like all the owners and the people who, like Stratton just was, they were getting tired of, you know, the, the mayhem that was happening at the open. And, and for you to have that letter and it's, and it's inserted into the book is just gold. It's so freaking rad that you got that. But, and, and actually let, let, let's talk about this for a second though. Like, the book, like the the commitment that you made. I mean, you know, we'll talk about the other books that you've done as well, the Iverson book and the one on the Dominican Republic baseball. But it's like the decisions you had to make in this book. One that it's four hundred thirty seven pages, but the paper, the mat, the gloss, the cutouts, like the the that bomb drop of Andrew Muddy and that cutout, like the the stickers that are in there, the triple fold out, like. Whoever made that book must have been like, this dude's insane. Who? What does he want all yeah. this? Like, this was a really difficult, complex design to get that book the, to look the, the way it does. Like, hats off to you, man. And and I whoever that. printed it too, you know, because that's a that's quite a task, man. And that's that's having you know having done it several times before with the same printer and having this relationship that I trusted yeah. and they knew how crazy I was and what I wanted to do. I love embellishments and bells and whistles, and I really just didn't want to do another book. Um, and then working with the greatest to me greatest team, you know, I, I got a lot of. I reached out to Seth Neary, and Seth and I had crazy conversations. Herb George, Barry Dugan. Mm -hmm. Marin Horikawa. Marin was like amazing. Marin is the one who designed the book and. 
I actually started off with another designer and the, this designer was the guy who did the Iverson book. And I thought it would be cool to talk to somebody like that, that did not know snowboarding because I was yeah. curious to see what their take was on it. And you know, it didn't work out. So I switched over and Marin took over and then it was like gangbusters and he did a yeah. great, great job. All right. Well, let's do this. Cause you know, we, we want to make sure we still have time for questions. Sure. I want to talk about, you know, <laughs> move to Boston, you know, you, you end up working for a hot minute for, you know, a, a snowboard brand, you know, generics, but then like saw, you went to Solomon and then you ended up in Reebok. So it was like a big shift in terms of like, hey, I'm getting real. I need to make some money. And like, you know, give, give us give us the rundown on how that all happened. And you like taking your career to another level, to another place. Um, man, so big. I mean, just being able to get out of snowboarding, I was having a baby. Me and my, um, my girlfriend were having a baby and it was really important for us to focus on that and start our family. So um, I moved to, to Boston and, you know, and just by the grace of God, Jamie Meiselman was leaving Trans World as a photo editor and he was taking over being the GM for generic snowboards and he was looking for somebody to run their customer service department. We linked together and here I am now with my first corporate gig. Uh, with generics, which was fun because I got to shoot, I got to work a little bit, and I got to see a lot of that, that side, which was a great um, uh, resume builder, right? Generics went out of business, and then I got picked up by um, Solomon, and I worked for Solomon as a photographer for them, shooting both their ski and snowboard teams, yeah. and, um, and then literally a year in, Adidas buys them, and then the Adidas, you know, sat with us and they were going to um, sh move us out to uh, Oregon. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I flew out to Oregon on their dime, try to oh. find a house. They wanted me to move there. And we just decided it wasn't the right fit for our family. Um, and um, and that, then I had to search for another job. So in the meantime of me searching for another job, I ended up going to work for a film house in Boston. I was developing film. I was still shooting snowboarding. So I was developing my film for free. And I was, I was taking advantage of that. But as I was there, I, one of my clients was Reebok and they were doing a lot of, um, you know, uh, prints and like duplicate slides and things like that. So I made friends with them. And the girl that I was befriending there ran the digital department and she was leaving because she was having a baby. Well, she was yeah. telling me I should apply. I applied. I ended up getting the job. And what my job was, was to run, basically archive all of their film yeah. for everything they did, because this is pre-digital, right? So it was like, scanning prints sharing them um, on a server that we help create called merlin so like people in china or in um, you know the middle east or you know or europe could access all this data that they could use for their websites for whatever else anyway yeah. that's how it all started and um you know and and, and i ended up you know uh, going on a shoot with alan iverson to see how it works you know they didn't want some skate photographer surf snowboard photographer to, to shoot anything for them i wasn't that good of a photographer yeah. um so yeah. i ended up going and i and i and i shot uh behind the scenes with alan iverson with my little camera and a couple black and white you know rolls of film and i um went to my house and i processed the, the negs and then I made a few prints and then I hung them up in my cube at work at Reebok. This is fun. It's a great story. And um, I was proud of them because it was like, one, it was Alan Iverson. This guy's a legend. I got, I got shots and black and white shots, Alan Iverson. Oh my God. Like no one even knew I was there. I was like flying the wall. So like the next day I come into work and the pictures are gone. I'm like, somebody freaking stole my prints. And I remember we had this cool phone PA system. And I remember hearing like the president secretary, um, Gary, uh, could you come see Bar uh, Brenda in her office? And I'm like, oh no. And she was like, this was a notorious, like mean president of Reebok at the time. I walk over there kind of with my tail between my legs. Like, cause I used to do some shady crap. So I wasn't sure what I was in trouble for this time. And I go there, I sit down and she's like, throws this envelope down on the, on the table. Are these yours? And I'm like, I look at them and it was the Iverson friends. And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and she says, um, can I use them? I was like, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can use whatever you want. And she was like, great. And then she's like, thanks. Uh, sign this right here. Boom. And I left. Next thing I know, two weeks later, I'm at the airport and I see Rolling Stone. I'm flipping through it. And there's one, my shot that I took of Alan Iverson for a Reebok ad in Rolling Stone. I'm like, what? Yeah. Rolling Stone magazine are you kidding I was like so stoked and then it was just like 
And then from that moment on, I think she knew that I was this young kid, wasn't making a dime and get him to shoot it. Get Gary to shoot it. We're not paying somebody to shoot this. Get him to shoot it. So I, I, I got a chance and I uh, took advantage of it. And I, I was there for Reebok for eight years. And as I grew, as that company grew and signed guys like Pharrell, like you see here, or Jay-Z or Allen Iverson or any of that stuff, I was the dude shooting all that stuff to save them money. And I had to learn and I had to light everything and I had no assistance. And I had to really like cut my teeth there, even though, even though I, you know, shot all the snowboarding stuff, fast paced action. And I got to, you know, really learn how to use a camera there. I tell you what, Reebok, man, that is where I really was like high pressure situations. All right, you got Venus Williams, go. You got Allen Iverson. We don't know what we're doing. Just shoot some cool shit. I mean, it was that type of scenario. Wow. This was before anybody had a job working for any companies as a photographer. And um, thank God they let me go in 2007 for a mistake. I ended up shooting Lance Armstrong for the cover of Runner's World. And it, and it was just as Adidas, how ironic is this? Adidas buys Reebok. Again, another company I work for gets bought out by Adidas. They ended up, so I shot Lance Armstrong. Adidas had owned us very freshly, like maybe like two months in. And Nike had sent a behind the scenes crew to shoot um, Lance in, in, in the shoot because he was wearing the Livestrong shirt and Livestrong bracelet. Sure enough, Nike puts it on their website. Our guys see it. Isn't that our photographer shooting for Nike? Fired me on this, literally as soon as I got in the door, they fired me. And uh, I went on my own. I've been on my own ever since. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I'd probably still be there. So Wow, that's traumatic, though. You pretty know, crazy, like, oh, pretty crazy like, story. You get to, to answer, answer for yourself there. They're just like, boom, you're out. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, these, these photos of these athletes, and you know, it's just, you know, I mean, I, I've seen some of the stuff you did with Fifty Cent with like the big, like these big sets and all this, and it's yeah. like, wow, you you just you took something, the knowledge and then the personality that you have to be, I mean, to be able to like work with these celebrities and these athletes and you got to have a connection for them to be able to present themselves the way you see them in these images i mean look at the i mean come on tom brady are you kidding me like he i don't think a lot of photographers are going to be able to elicit that that look and that response and to have yeah. have that set the way it is you know like you, you really you're you're professionally you're, yeah. the, the level of professional work that you're doing right now is just really really cool i hope young if there's young kids watching this too it's like take that passion and really focus and stay focused on it and run with it you know and, and this this it's like look where you ended up you know it's it's not a it's not an accident you know what i mean it's it's yeah. it's you positioned yourself and you do you do just incredible work it's really awesome to see so the other thing i wanted to you know just kind of put out there is that you know with um you got a chance uh, to interview Jake Burton after he, uh, you know, was recovering from his very, very, very serious illness, the, the male official syndrome thing. And uh, so tell me a little bit about that, because th that must have had extra resonance, as Pat Bridges was saying, you know. Yeah, about it did. It did. Like, it's, it's funny, because at that point in my career, I'd shot pretty much a lot, everybody, you know, people say, you shot everybody. I've shot a lot of people, you know, but I had never really had time with Jake. And like, obviously I knew who Jake was. I'd been to Burton several times. I've, I'd had interactions with him on the Hill, but I've never really had, a, I didn't ever do a photo shoot. So I remember when Pat asked me to do that, I was, it felt like I was shooting LeBron James. I mean, this guy was my hero, you know? And so I went there and I remember, um, you know, trying to figure out how I wanted to shoot it and being able to ask Jake. Jake walked me through his personal archives. Man, it was insane. He was like, where do you ever you want to shoot, Gary? And I saw this wall that he had made for some, it was like a, almost like a, dis a display, but he kept it. And I'm like, I want to use this. And we brought it out and yeah. we set it up. And he was just so humble mm -hmm. and so wonderful to be around. And like him and Donna, and they were just like, you know, they just, it, they were like, it was like I was shooting my friends. They were like, hey, can we get this shot? Hey, do you mind if I do this? Do you mind if I do that? Yeah, Jake, let's go. I can't bring in another board. And like, it was just, it felt really cool. And to be able to have Abby there and like Todd Coleman there and, we, and, yep. and Bridges, we all had, it was a moment I'll never forget. And it was special to me. And it was like the first time I ever really like 
got to spend quality time with Jake like that. And especially with him coming off of Miller Fisher syndrome and him talking about it, him talking about the letters that he wrote while he was in there and couldn't speak and couldn't write. Yeah. And just, it was just, and how humbled he was by it. Like, yeah. like he, you, nothing's going to stop people, me. When they see the film, you know, Dear Writer, you, people just, they have to realize like, yeah. you know, everyone has to realize like that dude worked, you know, super hard to get to where he was, but then like, you know, he lived life to the max. And then, you know, you, sometimes these crazy things happen like that. And, you know, I, I mean, he, he's like, Hey man, I, I'm going to try to beat this. And he did beat it. You know, then he had, you know, he just had round after round of, of setbacks, but anyway, the, the what you captured in, in that, and you see it in the film too, like they use some of your images yeah. in that film. It's really special. You know what's but funny actually, do I think about, Chris, is yeah, the fact yeah. that, like, people think of Jake and they thank Jake for snowboarding. They thank for what he did. But I look at it in a different way, too. Like, I think Jake for, like, you or JG or, 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 or Barry or anybody that I associated or that I met at Burton or that Burton hired, he was had a hand in that. Like, he was part of that. You know yeah. what I mean? So, like, I've to me, all that's so important. Or the writers, like, the Jeff Brush, the word ter Terrier, like, you know, yeah. Craig Kelly, for crying out loud. I mean, all these people that came through that door, like, yeah. that's all part of him. Like, he has, a, you know, all that's, you know, I look at that and all be a Jake. So, yeah, we, you know, that was as, as sad of a time that that was, that his passing. I'm just so thankful that I got a chance to actually, yeah. like, hang out with him and, 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 you know, be a part of that. That's great. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna lob a couple of questions at you here, and, and I think we'll we can tee up some some chat stuff too here, question and answers. Um, but I, you know, one of the things I always like to ask people is like, who would you say are the most influential people in your world of snowboarding? Like, what one one two or three people? And I, and I'm putting you completely on the spot here, so that's kind of like, you know, hey, it's you know this person or it's this, you know. This this is really means a lot to me, and it can be you know, in any level, any person, you know. I'd have to say my wife first. Yeah, because yeah. I met her at Killington. She was like the first person I ever met, and if it wasn't, I mean, I changed a lot when I met her. So like that yeah. was like snowboarding and my wife go hand in hand. It's really funny. Oh, that's cool. And in the book, I yeah. I, put our passes where we work together but i would say her first because she allowed me to do what i what i needed to do yeah yeah i wanted well, then, to do. i think that's first story. and foremost but then it's like the, the, and then i'm gonna look at it from a local level um jameel khan i'm gonna oh. i'm gonna throw him out there jameel was hugely influential to me because one he was in like he's jameel's no longer with us but he's always with us you know, yeah. and he was, and, and he was like that when you, when you got to ride with him or be there, he was infectious. He's always smiling, right. laughing. He, every, you felt like happy when you're around him. So vibrant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, resonance, there it is again. Like that's, that word bridges throughout there. And, and, and like, but there's too many to mention, but just really quickly, I'll throw it out there. I, what I loved about our scene, okay. In my scene, East Street Archives, that, you know, Southern Vermont, Northern Vermont, you know, scene, was the fact that you could have guys that were pro already at the highest level, Jeff Brushies, you could Neary, Miller, any of these guys that already made it that were local guys, dude, they would come and ride with you. You're broing out, you're, you know, drinking a beer, riding in the same line with those guys. And it was like, they were your best friends. And like, they treated everyone with respect. And it was like, if you were in, you were in. And they didn't care if you were a girl, they didn't yeah. care what sex you were, what color you were. If you strapped in and you rode down a hill sideways, you were in. And, like, that is what was so special about that time. Dude, you know, snowboarding, that's something that is really unique about snowboarding is on the, the women's side of things. Like, in skating and surfing, especially in the 80s, late 80s, like, women, if they paddled out surfing, guys would be like, hey, get out of my way, girl. <laughs> or, like, they wouldn't show up at the skate park. But – in snowboarding, I mean that's all different now. Like it's like half the women, half the people in the water are, are women now. You, you know, skate parks, but snowboarding, like from day one, you know, Burton was incredible with offering equal prize money right from the start. But like someone like Trish Burns would show up at the pipe, and all the guys would be like cheering her on, or like Kyla Duffy, and just be yeah. like, "Yeah, man, go for it!" Or Jamie McLeod, like launching huge, and dudes were like always in snowboarding. 
never like, ah, get those girls out of, you know, they're in our way or whatever. It was never about that. The girls were always welcome and they ripped, you know, and it was just, that was rad about snowboarding and it still is, you know? So anyway, that's just the side note. Here's another question for you. If you could shoot, you know, you went snowboarding, perfect conditions, wherever that is, and you could shoot one rider and that's it. Like one rider for a day, perfect conditions. Who would you, who would you want to shoot and where? Or really just who would you want to shoot? Because I guess where it could be whatever. Dead or alive? That's your deal. Who? Yeah, anything. <clears throat> I would have to say Craig Kelly. Dude, there you go. Craig Kelly would be my first. Uh, my first guy since, since he's passed away, but then I would say Zeb Powell. From oh, my life. Zeb is so fun to shoot. Like, you just go – I mean, he's like – Brings a level of intensity that I haven't seen. Like it's insane. Yeah, that guy's how about stuff. this? What if you had to spend a day riding with somebody, obviously living with no camera, where you're just shredding? Wow. One person, Jackson Hole or whatever, or AK or Baldface or whatever, just shredding, no camera. You, Cope. Ah! <laughs> we'll again, yeah, dude, stuff. we would have so much fun, we'll do, dude, because we'll we, we, we go so back and we know what's up. So hell yeah, you and me, <laughs> I'll take you high five and powder all in our face, you know, bald face. That's we got to make that happen. But dude, you know what? Back to like, if you ask me who my three would be, like I would put Jake top of the heap. I'd put Michael Jagger, who was the design agency. Oh, yeah. But I, I learned more from that dude and just admire everything about that guy. And then, you know, Jeff Pensier, who owns Baldface, that dude's living the dream, worked really hard, is. made Baldface happen, and is so pure to snowboarding. And I, I love that dude because of that. So but true. a million different, you know, people, like all the, you know, like from way back, Dave Alcott, <laughs> like what's stimulating oh, no. that? It's like people who would just... So passionate on Neil Corn and just driving it, you know. But anyway, let's do this. Like I, I know there's some questions here, and I want to ask Abby. Like, how, how do you want to? How do you want to do this and get some questions in here? Do you just want to click on them, or do you want to click on them, Gary? Or how how do you want to do this? Why don't you, um, Chris? Why don't you go through and All ask right, the ones go. you want, and I'll I'll clean it up as you go along. Perfect. You might have to clean up some of this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. uh, so there it was. What riders did you enjoy most photographing during the 90s? You know, so oh, like give that's a easy for me to say because, you know, my guy like Jimmy Kelly won because he always pushed the envelope crusher yeah. because someone was going to go crusher just <laughs> I'll do it. He'd be the guy. He was like the, the king's food tester. You would do anything first and yeah. then you set the set the stage for everybody else. That's awesome. This is from Max Holzman, and Max is a rad dude. He he yeah. worked with Burton way back. And then he said, for Cope, who's your, what's your favorite or most memorable U.S. Open moment when I was emceeing? You know, there's a lot, but I, I can just throw a few. Like, seeing Mike Michael Chuck throw a double chuck was just scary and just so – that broke the record. Like, that was insane. I loved, you know, Todd Richards going at, going at it with, with Hawkinson and, you know, just things like that. I mean, there were just – there's so many things there, but yeah, just to be quick on that. Okay, here's another one. Edward Reinhardt, back in the early days. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that just jumped. Sorry, brother. <coughs> uh, Josh Brown, wait, you like snowboarding? What? You kidding me? All right, Cope and Gary, great to see you guys again. The book release, the events went great, but when it's on snow reunion, when's the on snow reunion going down? Bring it. So we'll uh, you can I'll do it right now, guys. Right now. Just, so you know, just so you know, just so you know. You know me, man. I don't do anything half-ass. I don't say things without doing them. So, yes, I, the pandemic came. I built up. I did this book. We did this book. It was a very long process. Did the website, digitized videotapes, scanned in magazines, which I'm still doing. But one of the things I said to you guys, and if I've talked to you one-on-one -on -one or, or you've heard me speaking on my uh, interviews with people, I've said I want to do an On Snow event. Barry and I have been working super hard over the last two years. We've been talking with Stratton just because Stratton is near and dear to my heart. I lived there for a while. The U.S. Open was there. I've witnessed some of the greatest acts in snowboarding in my time there. I wanted to bring what I remember back to Stratton. So I'm announcing it now because I haven't announced it, but we are doing an event. Oh, yeah. Get ready for this. This is the event. You can see it. It's called Homesick. How appropriate. Homesick. This event is going to be in March, 24th through 26th. That's 23rd. We're going to have 
a retro pipe, literally small pipe, perfect in the spot where it used to be on Burnside. How about that? An OG downhill, fastest man wins. Zeb Powell Rail Jam, which is going to be great. And then not only on snow stuff, we have off snow stuff as well. There's going to be a speaker sneer series. We're going to bring in people. We're going to talk snowboarding. We're going to have a vintage board swap. There's going to be a poker tournament. I am not going to tell you, but I'm, I'm not going to tell you who's showing up, but trust me when I, when I tell you this, I've talked to a lot of the legends of yesteryear and like a lot of dudes are showing up and I cannot wait for you guys. We'll be announcing it. And when they, trust me, just check out the Instagram account and you'll start seeing when people are confirmed, they're going to show up, but this is really exciting. I hope you guys, uh, we're, we're going to put packages together. We're going to start, you know, putting things and information up on the website, yeah. but it's, home, it's called homesick. It's a, it's a shred and, and culture festival. Uh, it's going to be at Stratton and I'm Love so it. proud, so proud that we're, we're able to do this. Yeah. There was a, there was one question on here. It said uh, from Kenny Cloutier, it says, uh, do you think a major competitive snowboarding event like the U.S. Open could be hosted in the Northeast today? And what would it look like to make that happen? And, I, you know, I'd say there's potential, but, you know, the, the, there were very significant reasons why the U.S. Open had to move. Like, snowboarding has to progress. It has to change, right? And and there's all these people who are, like, you know, into nostalgia and, like, oh, like, it was so much better back in the day or whatever. Well, like, for TV and for all that, like, you know, it's got to be blue sky or sunny or at night and the infrastructure to build all that. I'm not saying it won't happen, like, because every, everything changes and progresses. But having cool events like this that are rootsy and that, you know, really mean something to people, that, that's going to be a lot of fun. So come out and join us on that. Actually, here's a good question from, from JG. Like, you want to talk about the foundational legend, right? JG! Hey, what other photographers from the '90s would top your list? And I mean, I can throw some names in there, but I want you to you to name that because you you know the people that you you look oh my toward. God, there's so definitely. many good ones, man. I mean, obviously, yeah. starting off with Trevor Graves, definitely. Gunnar's right. Elmets, Gunnar's, yeah. Derek Catella, Shem yeah. Roos, dude, Shem, Jesse I'm Loomis, good. George Cavalla. Yep. I mean, and, dude, the list the list goes on. Freaking. Um, Don Lander, there's a lot of them, man. Um, That's great. Tim Zimmerman. Tim Zimmerman. Yeah. Here's the like, thing, like Cole Barish, you know, like Cole Barish. I mean, like yeah. then you got guys to me though, like pre '90s, like Bud Fawcett, Ken Achenbach, you know, um, Scotty Starr. Like these guys were incredible lensmen, and and it brings me to this, which is really great too, because and I'll I'll just talk just for two seconds about it. Um, I didn't, I did East Creek Archives because I knew I had to do that personally as a photographer. I want to do that for my guys, put out this yearbook for them to have on their table. They can look through and see stuff, right? But I knew I wanted to do something else for other photographers as well. So with the, with the, you know, me doing all these other books, we are working on another book right now. It's been in the works for a while. And that book will be incredible. And it will feature tons of photographers that you well know. Um, and, um, you know, that, that book is, is going to be, it's, it's being worked on now. It'll probably be, you know, a year away from being made, but it's going to be four decades of snowboarding. Uh, it's awesome. insane. So that's, that's going to be my next, the next book that's coming out. That'll be, well, this is cool. This is a question from Ke uh, Kevin Queenan, who again has really good roots uh, in snowboarding too. But he said, Hey, what, you know, what would your advice be for an up and coming photographer and what's your favorite shred publication, you know, from really mainly from the past, because really Bridges is probably the only one that's, that's <laughs> doing shred pubs now, but uh, yeah, like any advice for up and coming photographers, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, dude, honestly, shoot, shoot, shoot. I mean, like I'm shooting, I'm shooting campaigns for Apple on the iPhone. Like, I mean that, that if you don't have a camera, that's insane. If you yeah. do have a camera, shoot it. Just shoot cool stuff, set up stuff, go to the mountain, go at night, hike up with a couple of, you know, some strobes and like do your own thing. Like take advantage of the mountain, you know, form relationships with these mountains that you, that you live at or, ne or shoot nearby and just, you know, try to make arrangements to shoot stuff and set up things, find people to, to take pictures of. And as far as like shred mags, dude, slush is dope. Slush is really, really cool. There's a lot of good ones. You know, snowboarding journal is cool. It's a little more you know, polished and like, you know, uh, perfect bound. Um, but there's, there's a few of them out there, but obviously I'm going to, I'm going to go with slush just because Pat's yeah. my boy and uh, he's doing great how, stuff. How about this one? This one, 
you you can bail on this question for me, but I, I love like I love to know the answer to this shit right here. So <laughs> like when you start making decisions about your day rate, okay? Oh, your day rate. So you're like, am I charging <laughs> when did you charge like a thousand dollars a day? And then it's like, no, I'm ten thousand a day. No, I'm fifty thousand a day. No, I'm bop 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 like how did that work? Like, is, like, is it, it like, do you have an agent or like, yes, how I have agents. That out there? I have a couple agents. I've had agents since, you know, two thousands, <clears throat> but, um, I don't like talking money ever with people. I, like, do. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, look, I've, I, I, I still do jobs. Honestly, cope. I still do jobs for free. I still, if I see I something I care that, about, right. I still do jobs for free, but I also get paid really, really good money from big brands. That's um, sick. But see, but this you know, is the thing, like, when I see art, like, they, we have this big thing in Vermont, like, the art hop, and I, I love watching, like, little kids walk up to a painting with their parents, and they go, wow, that painting's $8,000. I want to be an artist because I want to, I can sell that and make $8,000. That's amazing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, dude, you know, it, like, it just opens people's minds. They're like, wait a minute, really? Photographers can make what for a day rate? Like, Giselle, when she gets shot, they're charging what two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a day for some of that shit. Annie know? Leibovitz makes one twenty five. Her day rate's one hundred twenty five thousand a day. That's why she doesn't yeah. shoot every day. But um, I love that. Anyway, we can get it, off it, that. It's, but it's, I love it's, it. Photography is a lucrative business, and and snowboarding is an amazing gateway to get into it. I know plenty of people right now. Peter Cirilli, Adam Moran, Blotto is insane. I mean, Blotto, these careers, these guys are having. Cole Barish, you know, anybody who shot snowboarding, it, it, so photography is a passion. If you follow your passion, yeah. whatever you want to shoot, Heck yeah. you're going to be successful at it. Here's one for you. It said, um, hey, Gary, what are the boards behind you and what makes them important to you? Like, give those a run. No, I, I got a lot of boards. I know. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, this is what I had kind of laying around the office. Yeah. But, um, there, is, there are a couple boards that are super sick. Um, this one is insane. 80s Chuck Barfoot swallowtail strap yeah. on. Yeah, brother. This is insane. This is like where it all started. Guys like Evan Fiend, oh, freaking dude. Bob Boyle. These guys were like riding these things, cruising like down Tahoe, like riding no edges. Now you're going way deep. You're going into like deep cuts now with Evan oh, so, Look at you, you know? Yeah. That's funny. Like I've got, you know, then obviously everybody knows what this is. Oh yeah, that's the Seth and Seth. Yeah, there you go. Right. That's so, fresh. That's a I've fresh got, one. I've got a decent amount of boards. I wanted just to have that, you know, up there. There's really it's not like those are my favorite boards. It was just more like those I had those kicking around and yeah. They mean a lot to me just because it's part of the history, right? It's part of, you know, it's just like cameras that I keep around, even though I don't use them. They're they were something I look back at and go, Yep, I remember when. So and we're going to have a vintage board swap at, at home seconds, yes. right? Yeah. So, hey. Really excited about that. There'll be a lot really of really, really sick boards. And and people um, can bring their own boards? It's just, or how's that going Yeah, there'll be, more, there'll be more about that. So, I think you could bring boards if you want, and you can yeah. consign them. You can bring them there. People can bid on those. Um, I'm going to have collections that are be coming in. Um, yeah. There's also going to be, just so you know, at this event as well, there's an art gallery and we're going to, I'm going to have amazing photographers displaying work there. I mean, everybody from Trevor to Bud to Blotto yeah. to Eastone to Mike. Let me throw Gita. this real quick. This is a good one. I don't know how we skipped this. How did the name East Street Archives come about? Like, that's important. So, East Street Archives came about because when I moved, when I transitioned from Virginia Beach to Killington, I moved to East Street in Rutland and I was there in one house for a while and then I moved to another house which was 70 East Street that's why if you look closely uh -huh. on the inside of the book there's a 70 there you go. that's got a got it I don't know if you can see it but it's like got a little 70 hit on there okay. see it all right there you go see this you learned so 70 East Street so East Street was where I kind of knew and where I realized that I wanted to be a photographer and I knew I was going to make a living at it. And like really quickly, so just so you guys know, my relationship with Copley is really special because Copley was the first person to actually buy images from me. And, and it's funny, I think you got, you know the story, Cope, but like I remember like getting my check of like shots of Jimmy Kelly or like of Ian Spiro in the waterfall, dropped a little melon and, and you turned it into an ad. And like 
that is was was such a humbling moment to be able to get a check and be able to buy film or like you know eat for like a month you know and i was so stoked i'm like yes this is working you know it's, it's so funny dude that i mean i remember that like yeah really, man really it was well. like so Look at this one here. greg swires chimes in hey man i'll give you 700 for that neary deck <laughs> <laughs> and, you know so there's like there's people lobbing some grenades here which are great like here's one like I don't know if people know who this dude is, Paul Graves, but he is Oh my god, oh my god. dude. Oh yeah. And and Red Bench series has an incredible, you know, he's he's done some great stuff with Red Bench. Like this guy oh, was, he wanted legend. to have his, his living event, legend. You know, one of the first snowboard events ever. It's not even called Suicide Six anymore. It's too bad. But anyway, he said, uh, Paul sent this note saying Frank Howard shot the first event in 1982 at Suicide Six for Vermont Life. Ever heard of him? I would say I have not heard of him, but I have seen. A I've got the magazine. You do have I, it. So I know? have that magazine. That's legit. Well, Paul, I hope he gets to have his, I guess it's the 40th anniversary of the first snowboard, 1982. So 2022. Paul Graves, legendary, super nice guy. First freestyle champion, snowboarding champion of all time. I hope he I hope he does it. And he was in like a Labatt Blue commercial or something. The first time snowboarding was ever on TV. He's a he's a legend. He's a sweetheart. Trish Burns. Oh, look at this. This is cool. Uh Trish Burns just wanted to say thanks, Cope and Gary, for everything you two have done over the years. Great to hear your stories. We shared so many good times. Big love. Like, man, you know, love like, you, Trish. She's, she's insane and incredible. You know. Oh, Jeff Shore. Look at this. I think you dropped wow. his name. Wow. Jeff. Yeah. He goes, hey, hey, Gary, the great book. Do you ever shoot film these days? If so, yes. when and where? So, yeah, of course, right? Yeah. I just did. I just had Alan Iverson here in the studio like last week, um, and I just shot this cool thing for Concepts, like a new shoe that's dropping. I shot all uh, sixteen millimeter film, and uh, and I still shoot some film and I still scan it. I love it, man, because it's got. You know what's funny? The nineties are back, baby. <laughs> it is, man. What's it's up? So bad. Dude, like, look at this shirt. I'm rocking a shirt. From, you know, it's it, it's back. It's film. Like Jenko jeans style. Like Gap is putting out Jenko style jeans again now, which whatever. I don't know oh, if that's man. a good thing or not. Here's Jamie Meiselman chiming in. Hey, oh. Gary, who's the most interesting person you shot outside of snowboarding? And then he's also like, hey, save me a spot on that bald face trip. I'm in. <laughs> Should have said Jamie Meiselman was the, one of the guys I wanted to ride with. <laughs> um, <laughs> God, man. I mean, I've shot some pretty incredible people over the years. Um, but I would have to, I mean, I, I have a lot of great stories. Obviously, I, you know, that's a whole other discussion. But like, I always tend to go to 50 Cent for whatever reason, because I feel like we just had this crazy connection. Like, he just took me underneath his wing. And like, I remember like, I've shot him probably 30 times. And every time I'd shoot him, he'd like, let me into his trailer. Like, gee, come on in, man. And like his management would have to stay outside. And I, I had this really bad relationship with Chris Lighty, who was like his manager, because he liked me more than he liked Chris. And it was just a weird thing. And then I remember on one shoot, 50 gives me his dog. I'm holding his dog. I'm shooting him for vitamin water. I'm holding his dog, and the dog's got this giant diamond brooch on, and I'm holding him, his little Jack Russell Terrier. 50 comes down like Scarface down from his, his mansion in, in Connecticut down the stairs. Like, yo, G, he goes, you like my dog? I'm like, man, he's great. You can have him. I'm like, I don't, I don't want your dog. He was like, oh, no, you're you going to take my dog. I'm like, I don't want your dog. He's like, please take my dog. Anyway, I'm calling my wife. I'm like, hey, honey, I'm coming home with the dog. No, you're not. I'm like, it's 50 cents dog. He's making me take. I'm like, all right, all right. So I end up bringing this dog to my house, bit everybody in the house, like instantly. And oh, yeah. So then what do we, so this is funny. Brings it back to Vermont. Annie calls. My wife calls up her sister. He's like, hey, uh, you want a beautiful dog? And she's like, I don't know. It's 50 cents dog. Oh, my God, I'll take him. We meet halfway somewhere in New Hampshire or wherever it was, and, like, we hand off the dog. That dog soldier lived in an A-frame up by Killington until he died. Like, wow. yeah. yeah. And I remember I saw 50 once before, and he was like, how's, how's the dog doing? He was like, this is what killed me. He goes, yeah, how's, how's soldier doing? Oh, like, he's doing great. He lives in Vermont. He was like, how much did you get for him? I'm like, I gave him to my sister. He's like, what? I gave you the birth certificate, had my name on it. You didn't sell him? I'm like... No, I, I could have though. Thanks, Fifth. You know, I was like, I don't know. I got a, I got a couple. This is a great one. This Ed Reinhardt. I don't. I'm. I think I know this dude, but I'm not sure. He said back in the early days, I felt as if 
there was a true East Coast snowboard vibe and feel. I grew up attending the U.S. Open in the early 90s at Stratton. I love seeing you both. U.S. Open was my glory days. I feel the East Coast has lost its real true snowboard feel, but I do love the book. Can't put it down. I remember throwing wickets around Stratton during the early Open days. Like, you know, like, I don't know. I'm I'm not always like, I'm not like big on the whole glory days thing, even though like this is kind of what we're doing, but it was a special time. And you know, like it, every time you go riding, you just make it, you know, make it the best you can and just like really realize how precious it is, precious it is to be on that hill. And who said that, Chris? Who said that? No, this dude, Ed Reinhardt. I, Ed, I, Ed, yeah. I'm gonna tell you, Ed, Gary here. I want to tell you, Ed. If you want a little piece of that, Ed, I'm show back. Up to this event, Ed, and exactly. you're going to get a little dose of that. It's going to be a yeah. micro dose of that. This is what you guys need. If you want to feel that, you want a hug, not a virtual hug. You want a real hug? Come here. Give me and Chris a hug. We're going to be here. We're going <laughs> to shred. Here's we're a gonna quick ride. one. You have something in your book about this, too. It says from Chrissy Auger, I think her name is. It's a time to share a favorite skate story from the for all, uh, for all the Floridians out there. She wants Ooh. a skate story. You had something about like the first time you shot Jesse or something like that. Or, I mean, not Jesse, yeah, Sergio Ventura skating. Well, I mean, like that's my first experience in shooting film or photos at all was because was I lived crazy. I lived right by Mount Trashmore. So I would go there and watch these dudes skate vert. And it was like, I mean, I watched Henry Gutierrez, Sergio Ventura, Bees yeah. Lovelace. Um, dude, Grant Britton was there shooting at the time. And then you got guys, I remember Mike McGill, Tony yeah. Hawk. You know, all of these guys, Lance Mountain, all those dudes came through because we had one of the best ramps. So that was like my, you know, being able to like shoot some photos, that was what it was for me. But like skate, look, skateboarding was what we were all into. We saw oh, yeah. skateboarding, we realized we could take that on the snow and we tried, that's why we grab our boards. It was funny. I've done, I did a shoot recently with some guys and I'm like, hey, are you going to grab? He's like, why do I need to grab? I'm like, what? And they were like, I don't need to grab. I'm attached to the board. And I was like, oh my god is that where we're going to now and i'm like i guess we, we used to grab because you had to grab a skate deck you know and how you grab was everything absolutely here's a good one from uh john Mannion. i mean, this kid was a ripper too i remember his scary cope recollections of mount snow and the local shred that uh was sort of the backseat to stratton like mount snow had some in Incredible riders that came out of the Jason Evans, and I mean that's where Kelly Clark, and I mean there were there were some rippers down there, and, and, like Teddy Ra, like some of those guys were really cool. Like you know they committed to the pipe, and like their park was always ball like balls out. That Mount Snow, respect man, you know that that place turned out some great riders. So yeah, still Here's one, still uh, Hugh Beecham says, uh, "How do you feel about the open moving to Vale? I I could do a whole podcast on that, and I'm not bitter. I, I just feel like. There was, it, ne it needed to move. I'm super stoked that they're that Stratton's gonna, you know, have this event. You know, it's not as it's it was not time. A, it was time to move for them. They, yeah, you know, it was it just yeah. got to a point. It was just got to a point. Business is business. You got to realize that this is a business, yeah. and it just was yeah. at some point. It just had to, you know, change. I agree. Here's one from Trish again. Trish Burns. How do you scan images from your archives and then fund a book? <laughs> I think she's really so you should be like, call me, girl. We'll talk. Trish, about yeah, give me a call, yeah. Trish, because I got that. We'll die. Yeah, you got photos. Let's do it. I mean, nowadays it's so simple, it's so easy. It's insane because of the Look. digital cameras. You don't even need a scanner. You just use your digital camera and shoot the slide, set it up. I can anybody who has a question, DM me. I'll hook you up. See that? Now here's this is like this is an anonymous person, but I love this. I'm a skier and a snowboard enthusiast, but I've never ridden. I said I totally love the enthusiasm of the session. Bring on the shred. Thanks for sharing. Like that's a red bench person that just yeah, man. came on and was like, This is rad. And thank you, red bench, you know, person that's 100%. supporting this. And I love that. That's what this is kind of all about. And then here's another one. Charlie. Oh, wait, Charlie Cavanaugh. Dude, here we go. It's so yeah, good to see SMS, you. SMS, baby. Live the stories. Thanks for the trip down memory lane. So stoked to see you guys at Stratton Homesick. So, you know. Another dude throws in like any any snowfall predictions for Vermont this winter, and it's, like, it's gonna dump, dog. Dump. Yeah, the squirrels there. in my backyard are going crazy right now. Yeah, couple things I want to just throw into like th there were these like posse's and crews. Like you had the the New Hampshire Dirts. We didn't even yeah. talk about those dudes. You know the Loon Waterville. Oh, 
you know, Pat Moore, like all these, you know, Bill Enos, all these dudes. And then like the VTSP thing, like the old school dudes, like, you know, the Hayes bros and, and, you know, you had Hoglin and all those dudes, man. Like we, it was just such a, such a rad, rad, you know, time. And all these like regional pros that just helped like foster this a really fun environment that a lot of people were just like, man, I want to be a part of that. I want to be in the mix here. And it's, it's really fun. Here's Jimmy Kelly. Hey man, you guys will thanks Cope and GLP for everything you've done for us degenerates. Okay. Well, I, I didn't say that, Jim. It was, it's crash I mean, test jummies, Jimmy, not degenerates. Yeah. All right. So wait a minute. We're at 815. I know people got real lives. Chris Van Wilgen. Oh my God. Volume two. There's a name from way back. Actually, another R RIP. Um, one of the old school Burton reps, Peter Seminara such Ooh. a rad dude he passed away um you know tragically and just you know that guy has a huge board collection so if anybody wants to uh seek that out um his board collection any of the boards that sell will go towards yeah um, and those boards will day. be available at yeah home sick at the board swap we've already been talking to them so it's gonna be great so let's let's wrap you know like talking about hey like the website you know you got instagram check it out Pick up this book. Yeah, guys, like, so check it out. This is the book. This is the so book we've all been talking about. It's very thick. Um, it's available to buy on the website. Um, I still have plenty left. It's got a lot of bells and whistles, really, really fun. Uh, it was a pleasure putting this together and, and revisiting all those times. It's funny just doing it, the amount of, like, you know, putting my eye to these slides and then scanning them, like, all the memories started coming back, and that's why I couldn't stop. That's why I was like, oh, I'll do a hundred and something page book. Oh, no, it's 200. Oh, my God, oh, it's 300. It just kept going, and I had to, like, stop at some point. So I'm just, honestly, I'm as happy that people like it because I was like, some people are just going to be like, they're gonna be like, who the hell is this person or who's that person? Or, like, I didn't even care. Like, I just wanted to do this, and it, it feels so good. Honestly, it was therapeutic a lot for me, and I, and I want, what? yeah. It's funny. People have coffee tables in the house, and if you don't, you can use that book as a coffee table. But like, put this in there, and people are gonna dig it. And then, like, yeah. if you want to show up and rock some gear, a t-shirt, a sticker, a hoodie, or whatever, and I'm not just trying to pimp you to buy shit or whatever, but like, these are badges of your personal history. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. East Street Archives is part of that, and it's uh, it's it's gonna keep going. There's a dude that we didn't sh have a shout out to really. Barry Dugan has put a lot of time and effort into like, you know, the events and, and making sure these things go off. So Barry, thank you. And Abby from Red Bench series, like, you know, I, she works super hard. I mean, there was, she did a show with snowboard graphics that was so great. And there's another show coming up. Uh, she might even probably go into this. I don't want to steal her thunder, but Scott Lenart, who did so uh -huh. many graphics for Burton, like over hundred graphics for Burton snowboards. They yeah. have a show up here. So if you're in Stowe, come by the uh, Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum because it's really, really well done. That The new show isn't up yet. Abby can probably cut they, in. And, uh, and, and I'll just I'll just, I'll just, just say as well, too, guys, consider, you know, this is a nonprofit organization. And, you know, these guys do amazing things for our industry. And, you know, it's this isn't skiing. This isn't snowboarding. It's, it's everything in general. So consider making a donation sometimes, you know, it's, it could be anything, but it just helps them to be able to do things like this. And, you know, think of the stories that are out there, right? So um, I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm very humbled, you know, to be a part of this and, you know, and, uh, you know, so good to be able to reconnect with you, Cope, and <laughs> hear these questions. And like, again, I'm really excited to see all you guys at the Homesick event this March. And I hope to God you can make it. There'll be more information on the website and on Instagram as the weeks progress. But um, this has been really fun, man. Yeah, man. Abby's back on here. <laughs> I'm back. You can, hey. you can tell us off at any point. Just tell us. <laughs> Me and Chris, we love to talk. If you know, we could go. We could go for forever, but I think this was great. We t we covered off on a lot of stuff, and I'm, you know, it's just, just super, super humbled, like I said, and just excited to be able to reminisce a little bit with Chris because Lord knows, man, we go back. And Chris knows. Chris experienced all this just like I did, and there's so many people that are listening in right now that – feel the same way we do about the sport and about yeah. you know the times that we spent together and again it's not over like i i always said to some people i said i feel like i left the snowboarding industry so quickly that it was like i feel like i have unfinished business and um you know i want whatever i do whatever you know barry and i and east street archives do we want it to feel like a giant hug we want it to feel like 
you know, it, it just something that makes you smile, you know, and whether that's talking about old you know, snowboarding from years ago or snowboarding today, snowboarding is a way to get out and get some exercise and, 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 and feel alive. And that's what we want to do. So to that guy who's like, I never tried it, get out there and try it this year. I guess I promise you what, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So before we close this out, do you have any, oh, that was, those are pretty good parting words, but any, any last things you want to say before we say good night? Well, thank you, Abby, for giving us the forum, you know, and you work hard. <laughs> I know you do. So it's appreciated. I hope other people dig it because, uh, you know, there's, there's great stories to be told and snowboarding is, it, it does connect people. It resonates and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so much fun. And Gary, like to see where the whole arc of your career is so amazing. And it's incredible to see like, like snowboarding changes lives, you know, and yeah. it has, and it changes a lot, all of our lives. We're all, we're all different. Really did change my life. That's for sure. In many ways, more than one, like I said, met my girl, yep. met two love, the, the two loves of my life, snowboarding and Annie land. Nice. So um, I got to say, well, I'll leave with this and it's probably appropriate, but pray for snow. I mean, that's pretty much it. And let's, uh, let's hope we have a great season and we get to see each other out on the uh, slopes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Gary. And thank you, Chris. This was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I'm sure I know the audience did too. That's not even a question. Um, and all of you in the audience tonight, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. They almost did the outro for me. Don't forget to make a donation in addition to, uh, you know, feeling really good about supporting your favorite nonprofit. You could win a pair of darn tough socks. Um, and so this is just the start of what is going to be a fantastic Red Bench season. Uh, I hope you'll continue to tune in each month. Uh, and this is the part where I tell you to come visit us at the museum, but we are currently closed. Um, and Chris alluded to this. We're installing the next exhibit. Um, we haven't officially announced it, but planned on telling you all tonight. At the end of next month, we'll be opening a solo show uh, of Scott Lenhart's work. And yes. Scott is a native Vermonter and has done who knows how many graphics for Burton. Um, and in addition to snowboard graphics, he's done work for Fish, Nike, Adidas, Mountain Dew, and so much more. So this exhibit will allow the viewer to step into Scott's work as it progresses from concept to finished product. So stay tuned for details on our exhibit opening party, which is scheduled for early December. Um, and I hope to see See you guys at these Red Bench events at the museum when we reopen, and maybe even out in the wild, like in March at Stratton at the Homesick event. And uh, thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Abby. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming to watch this conversation. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Bye.